Well, good morning, Hillside family and friends joining us from all over the world. How wonderful to be able to connect with you this morning and come and share God's Word. We are indeed a privileged bunch of people to enjoy God's Word. I mean, that's God's thoughts. That's God's heart. That's God's will for our life that He has given to us. And so we are gathered this morning around God's Word. What a joy for me to come and share his thoughts from his word with you. Indeed, I'm a privileged man as well. This morning, I want to uh, pick up where we left off last week and the week before. We were talking about the concept of becoming smaller in certain areas of our life. And becoming smaller mustn't be seen as loss. It must be seen as making room for great growth coming uh, in our life. And so I want to encourage us but I also want to pick up on that theme because there's a, a message in the Christian world today that I, I don't hear getting preached that often. Now look, it does still get preached, but it seems like the opposite of that keeps getting preached. I do it sometimes too. And you know, if you only listen to some of my messages and not to the others, it might seem that there's a bit of imbalance there. But you know, you need to stick with a pastor if he's preaching a series. Or you need to stick with a pastor so that you can see his full heart as the messages unfold over a period of time. And sometimes, as pastors, you know, we can become very susceptible to falling into a very subtle trap. In our sincere pastoral desire to encourage our people or to motivate our flock, we, we sometimes miss the wood for the trees. You know, we humans, after all, as well. It breaks our hearts to see our precious congregants going through a tough time. Any parent will tell you the same thing. You know, if a parent witnesses a child that's going through a time of physical pain or going through a time of heartbreak, man, that parent just wants to pick that child up and love them and encourage them. It's the same thing as a pastor. Let me tell you, if you've got a true pastor, then your pastor loves you, men. We love you to bits. And that's just the heart of Jesus towards his church. So when a pastor sees his flock or members in his flock going through a tough time, the first thing we want to do is to encourage you and to motivate you and uplift you and show you the truth from God's word and how good that truth is. Sometimes, though, You'll have some people say to that pastor, well, you know, you're just preaching good, happy messages, man. You're not telling people what they need to hear. I say, stick with that pastor for a while, man. That man has been put there by the will of God to, to encourage that flock. And he doesn't just have one person on his mind. He's got the whole flock on his mind. And so you will see the balance coming through in time. A little while ago, the Lord put on my heart a word for his church and it, and 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 this is where we've been building to uh, through that shrink message and and even going in today and and that is to do with the question what about contentment you know we often speak about breakthrough is coming or just hold on there blessing is coming material wealth will come your way or 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 something along those lines you know that job you've been waiting for and anguishing over it's coming your way and we often preach along those lines but here's the other side to it now what about christian contentment or what about when god says listen i need you to just be content with your situation and so you'll have somebody on the one side preach preaching hey endure keep going it's coming the breakthrough what about the Spirit of God that says, no, this is not about endurance. This is about contentment. This is learning to be satisfied with what I'm doing in your life. Although there are times when it is within our power or our understanding to make things better for that member or for that group of folks going through a tough time, we know all too well as the under-shepherds of Jesus, of the under shepherds of his flock and his church we know that the very best thing that we can do for any person going through a tough time is to prayerfully open God's word to them prayerfully take them to the scriptures and speak from the sacred text 
God's heart and God's will into that situation. After all, it is within uh, these most holy pages that we witness how the saints of the past endured many of the same or very similar trials that we endure today. Perhaps the props have changed, but the screenplay is the same. There is nothing new under the sun. So, we know that what we're going through today, somewhere the Bible has somebody that has gone through something similar. And that can speak then directly into our situation. And so what a privilege it is that we can open God's word, turn to those pages, see how they dealt with the situation. Whether they were in error, we can learn from their error. When they were in the right, we can learn from their proper approach and proper mindset and perspective into that situation. Now in our zeal to comfort, we are inclined to speak of endurance. And, and we will say, just, just come on man, you know what, breakthrough is coming. Uh, come on man uh, harvest is coming or a return on that investment will be forthcoming come on man i know i know that you've been betrayed i know that you've been hurt i, I know that you've been defrauded but you know what justice and restoration are on their way and you know when we speak like this the reason why we can speak like this is because we know that god is ultimately in control and god will always bring things to restoration and these are very very good it is good to seek out those scriptures that speak of hope when it seems like every avenue has been barred it is good to meditate on those passages that point to the imminent breakthrough that lies just over the next hill it is good to garner those promises that help dissipate those gray op oppressive skies of lack ah yes lack the source of so many of our anxieties no matter what area in our lives that blight of lack touches it leaves vast swathes of our lives withered dry and barren but have you ever thought about the matter differently i mean sometimes you just need to take the time to say whoa hold on let's change gears here I've been thinking about this situation in this way. Perhaps there's a different way to look at this situation. Have you ever explored the thought that there is far more to a season of lack than just learning to endure it or just tenaciously holding on uh, until you get to the other side? Don't misunderstand me. Endurance is fantastic. We need it. Far too few people have got that gumption to push through until the breakthrough comes. But what if there is more to a season of lack than that? You know, we South Africans have got a wonderful Afrikaans word. It's that word, fuspate. Literally, fuspate means to bite fast. It speaks of clenching the jaw and just being determined to endure it to the end, doing what it takes to get through it. So much of what we were, are taught in Scripture uh, so much of what we are taught about these difficult seasons in our life is just about that fuss bait. A jolly old slap followed by the usual pep talk. Chin up! Just hold, it, hold on. Hang in there. Things are going to change. And that's the essence of the messages that we preach. Hold in. Breakthrough's coming. Now all of these are well and good. But what if the lesson to be learned from a tough season involves far more than just fuss bait. If tough seasons are limited to teachings uh, about endurance, then our growth will be severely stunted. There's so much more to be learned through a difficulty or through a trial. We, we may have learned to endure, but, but unto what end? What if you do get through it? Uh, what if you get to the other side only to realize that the true lesson has been left back there in the gauntlet somewhere. For example, what if a trial of lack has been designed specifically tailored to change you? Not to, not to just get you to endure, but to change you, uh, to quieten 
within you those incessant fires of covetousness that can at times burn so ravenously. This is not the type of trial to get through. This is the type of trial to engage with, to interact with. Now I understand there may be a part of you that, that protests against this suggestion that there's a part of you that is covetous. Uh, you may argue that a vice as serious as covetousness only afflicts the spiritually immature, a carnal Christian, or perhaps even a new Christian. But surely you've come too far to be susceptible to, to such a careless dereliction. Surely your love for the Lord is too sincere. Now to such objections, I, I would caution the utmost of care, because the scripture puts it this way. Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. So, no matter how advanced we may reckon ourselves to be in the matters of our faith, we must always remember that it is often not the more advanced matters of our faith that require our most meticulous care. Rather, it is the neglect of those more rudimentary issues that lead to the most perilous of slopes. The, the, the point is that the purpose of a season of lack extends beyond the lessons of endurance. What if a season of lack is intended to birth within you one of the most precious of all spiritual seeds, that seed of contentment. What if, until now, we have not pursued that seed because we have lost sight of the true nature, promise and joy of contentment because we've been more focused on endurance, just getting through it. It is true that once contentment has been seeded within you, you will still have to nurture that kernel with skill and diligence. It will require time before you see the buds or blossoms, but be assured that when that seed of contentment begins to produce, you will savor the succulent fruits of this most precious of virtues. Now, it is important to bear in mind that contentment does not by any means imply that a child of God, most high, must surrender to poverty, as some people understand it. Now through the church age, there, there have been some who have dedicated their lives to the theology of poverty. Before I express my opinion on the matter, let us agree on a definition of poverty, so that we know what we're talking about and so that we've got the same concept in mind. If, when speaking of poverty, we have in mind that which is defined as not having enough material possessions or income for a person's needs, then we need to stop and think about what that means or what it implies for a Christian. If this not having enough implies starvation, then I must object in the strongest terms and the strongest objection that I have is a biblical one because the psalmist said I have been young and now I'm old yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread Psalm 37 and verse 25 are you righteous is your righteousness founded upon Christ then here's the promise. Neither you or your children will ever face the trauma of having to beg for bread. The Bible says so. So if that's your understanding of poverty, then, then you can keep it. I don't believe that that's what the Bible speaks of. You, 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 you just continue to walk in righteousness and God will take care of the bread. Right? Did he not do this by providing manna for the Israelites in the wilderness? If this not having enough implies 
not having clothing to wear, then again I must raise an objection. Because Jesus promised that these things would be added to us. Go read it for yourself. Matthew chapter 6. The things Jesus said would be added included clothing and food. He says, your father knows that you need these things. Now if on the other hand, not having enough means that the lack which we experience is a catalyst. Listen to me carefully. The lack that we experience is a catalyst to experience the miraculous provision of God. Then I'm all in. In fact, I've seen this unfolding in my life, not once, not twice, but many times. And it is exciting when God starts breaking through into your areas of need. When God starts meeting your areas of need. Because you've been in a situation where you just absolutely could not do it for yourself or supply it for yourself. But man, when God breaks through, he's, the way that he does it, the imagination that he uses will blow your mind. Uh, th there have been many times in my life where I have not had enough in some areas or another. Even to this day, there are times in my life where I have not got enough. And I'm sure you can say the same thing as well. But, but God, in His own way and in His own time, has always provided for me. I remember... When I met Bren, I was still an assistant pastor. Now by assistant pastor, I mean very poorly paid. You know, whenever you get, even in the job market today, you get the word assistant, like assistant manager. I'll interpret that for you. Cheap labor. So I was an assistant pastor back in that day. But, but God was adding to me more things than a fat paycheck could have provided. He was giving me wonderful experience and teaching me wonderful lessons in those days I, I was i was gathering as much as experience as i could whilst working under the then senior pastor but besides experience there was very little to be gained in the way of remuneration and in due course uh, I, I did gain one of the most precious blessings in that setting that God could bestow, bestow on any person. That was a betrothed, a fiancé. Bren and I met while I was working as an assistant pastor, completing my studies in those days. Now, it wasn't quite as simple as that though, because just before I asked Bren for her hand in marriage, I became aware of an insurmountable dilemma. You know when you get that quiver in the liver. Here was my heart as a young man. All so excited thinking of the proposal. And then a thought came to me. Warren, what about the ring? Now that was a big thing. Because you know I, I, this, this was my bride to be. I had a, you know, I had a heart to place a ring on her finger. I had a heart for it. But I didn't have the money for it. I didn't have the income for it. There's no way that I could afford a decent ring. Now listen, we've all seen those romantic movies where somebody will take a little blade of grass and maybe weave it and put, put it on her finger and she's all smiles and yes, the, I tell you what, she's smiley on the outside but on the inside she's not very impressed. When you, when you, when you propose to your wife, I, I believe you need to trust God for the ring. And if you can't afford it, you need to be like me. Take it to the Lord in prayer. I couldn't afford a ring. I couldn't even afford any part of a ring. Not only a diamond, I couldn't afford a little diamante to go into the ring. My focus then was just to do God's will and to walk in His life. And walk in His will for my life that He had. And to serve Him. So that's where I was focused. Be that as it may. On one occasion, I remember I was busy preaching and the Lord laid something heavily on my heart while I was preaching. And I turned to Bren and I said to her, I said, my darling, the Lord has just put on my heart. And he did in a strong way that, that I one day will put a rock on your finger. One day I will put a rock. It's something that I felt strongly the Lord laid on my heart. Now, I didn't substantiate what size that rock could be 
or would be but the Lord put on my heart he's got this he's gonna take care of this it was something that I believed uh, that the Lord wanted me to become very very aware of he wanted me to become convinced of and to rejoice in is that this area of poverty this area of need God's got this God's gonna take care of this like I say I didn't specify what size that rock would be I just knew that as deeply and as in love uh, as Bren and I were with each other and as enthusiastic as we were to start our life together God was even more excited for our union I want to tell you God is romantic man God loves it when his children fall in love and and they find their life partner and and I believe that God said listen it's my heart for you to get married and I will provide for that marriage if ever there was a good example of not having enough at that stage in my life I was it I, I was a good example but here's the thing it was God's will for us to be married and God always takes responsibility for his will this is the joy of knowing and discovering and discerning what God's will is for our life because if you know what his will is you may not have the worldly finances according to the world you may walk in a, in poverty according to the world standards but I want to tell you something you'll have all the resources of heaven because God will provide for your needs I, I, I knew that my bride-to-be deserved a ring the ring of her dreams and I also knew that I could not provide for that ring but I was willing to trust God to meet my needs my financial circumstances at that time fit perfectly with the definition of poverty not having enough but not having enough did not mean that I had to go without because I am the child of God the God who has oh so much more than enough when the wedding day came praise God my testimony then and my testimony for all time shall be that when that wedding day came I was able to put a beautiful ring on my bride's finger it was a ring get this of her own design and it donned a generous diamond on it as well out of my league out of my hands out of my capacity but not out of God's and God provided that period of poverty that I went through at that stage and any area of not having enough that I have even to this day will show you something about God because that day I learned a lesson it opened up to me that there was a different economy there was economy an economy that was different to the economies and the financial systems of this world and that economy is only available to God and to those that are willing to trust God with their finances it taught me to look not to man or to the financial systems of man but to God and although I was poor it was then that I became truly rich I became truly rich because that season also imparted indelibly it imprinted on my heart an affirmation an affirmation from my Heavenly Father and this is what the affirmation was a short time later when I prayerfully thanked God for his wonderful generosity towards me and my fiance I could feel him speaking directly into my heart he said to me my son I will always provide for you that which is truly good to this day there are times when I do not have enough in certain areas of my life but whenever I look at that ring that ring is a physical manifestation it's a physical reminder of the lesson that I learned back then whenever I look at that ring I am reminded that my God is my provider and when God provides for you it's not that uh, he's not going to provide for you in terms of the world's poverty no you go through that area of lack so that you can see your God's generosity 
The ring that I put on my wife's finger was not a small little ring. This was a ring of her own design with a generous diamond and stone on it and beautifully made because that's the ring that God had in mind. Not just for me as, her, as his son, but for her as his daughter. Now, would you interpret this lack of financial means that I was going through as my living in poverty? Well, I suppose that if you were to define poverty as being in a state of perpetual dependence upon God. Listen to me what I'm saying. Poverty defined as being a state of perpetual dependence upon God then absolutely positively and joyously I concur I'm in but please be sure to add to that definition that God has always supplied all of my needs by providing those things that truly matter those things that are truly important uh, let me add that I would far rather be in a state of perpetual dependence upon God than in a state of perpetual dependence upon the systems of this world. And that's where so many people find themselves. They are dependent upon the financial systems. And make no mistake, dependent upon the financial systems of this world. Now let me ask you, son and daughter of the Most High God, who would you rather be dependent upon? Know the God whom you serve. When, when I put my children to bed at night, they are clean, they are happy, they are loved, and their tummies are full. Now that really matters. And God has provided what really matters. When, when my family sits around our table to eat our meal, our, our table always has more than enough. And that really matters. When we lie our heads down to sleep at night, we do so in a warm, safe, loving home. That really matters. I am blessed with a happy marriage and a wife that loves me. Listen, if you're going to lay your head down next to somebody and fall asleep, it helps to know that they love you. That really matters. My family is healthy. That really matters. We have been blessed with wonderful friends. That really matters. I know of some very wealthy people who would pay a fortune to own some of these blessings that I've just mentioned. But these cannot be purchased. They cannot be bought. Why? Because they're priceless. That which truly matters, that which is priceless, God will give unto you. That, that which is priceless cannot be purchased, but it can be given. Our Heavenly Father is the giver of good gifts, priceless gifts. Perhaps you could put it this way. My God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 I quoted there from the King James Version. Just break that sentence down a little bit. Hold on. Let's just camp here for a moment. Let's just take time to break that sentence down into each of its precious components. Every one of them is amazing. Listen again as I repeat the words slowly. My God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. My God my living God, my all-powerful, all-knowing, loving, compassionate, generous God. Jesus said, your Father knows what you need even before you ask Him. Matthew 6 and verse 8. My God shall supply. You see what He says? My God shall. This is not a matter of if perhaps or maybe the Bible says my God shall supply he's gonna do it there, there may be times that the devil tries to convince you that he's not gonna do it you just need to put that devil back in his place and remind him that your God is not a man that he would lie and his word is without error and his promises are sure and he has promised that he shall provide for you he shall provide for 
all your needs. Do you see that? All your needs. He knows what you need and he shall supply it. Not a portion of it. Not a down payment or a deposit of it. God is not a, a deposit kind of God. Uh, the only people that need to put a deposit down are the people that can't afford the whole thing. Let me tell you, God can afford the whole thing. And the Bible says that He shall supply all your need. In other words, if you don't have it, then you don't need it. Not right now, anyway. You may need it in an hour's time. You may need it in a week's time or you may need it 10 years from now. And if you need it then, then listen to what the Bible says, then you shall have it then. God determines your need, not you. It's not your circumstances that determine your need. God determines your need. And if you need it, you shall have it. So there's your peace. If you don't have it, God in his wisdom has determined that you don't need it. The Apostle Paul, who wrote these words, got to know God's faithfulness so intimately, so beautifully, that he could even comment on the measure according to which God would meet the needs of his beloved children. Listen. According to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Let me clarify. That's not according to the interest rate. It's not according to the oil price. That's not according to the dollar. It's not according to the pound. The, 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 the measure by which God supplies our needs has to do with glory. Not your glory, His glory. Have you ever taken the time to consider the entire heavenly host? That, that, that's angels, that's cherubim, that's seraphim, that's good angels and bad. The entire heavenly host is a witness of the means and the measure that God uses to take care of his children. As an earthly father, let me just speak to you right now. As an earthly father, as far as humanly possible, and by the grace of God, I make sure that my children's needs are taken care of. There, there are even times when, by the grace of God, I can experience the great delight of taking care, not just of their needs, but also of their desires. Oh, and let me tell you, seeing the joy on their little faces when I put that item of their desire into their little hands. That's priceless to me. That's one of my greatest joys as a dad. It's one of the greatest joys as a human being that I could experience is to see the joy of delight on their face. Just the other day, uh, we bought Emmy a little set of fairy wings. You know, she's into the little fairies now, you see. So, so we bought her this set and my goodness, she, th th this, this child was so overjoyed, her little face, so delighted. What a joy it was to me and Bryn. If, if I had a little video clip, I would have shown you that video clip of her little face. Delighted. The joy that I... And you know, it must have cost me about 30 bucks, man. That's 30 South African Rand for that small thing for her. But what joy it brought to my daughter. And as such, what delight it was for me as my father. Why? Because my children have learned to truly appreciate when their daddy blesses them they appreciate it and, and it is this appreciation it's more than it's more than just the joy of their receiving it's the fact that they appreciate it that brings me great joy have you ever given something to somebody i'm saying something that was important to you or something that cost you something have you ever given something of value to somebody and, and, and they just sort of disregard oh thanks yeah they didn't really appreciate it have you ever had that? It's like all of a sudden you feel like, oh, well, I shouldn't have, you know. I'll tell you why they didn't appreciate it. Why? Because they have too much. They don't, they don't need another gift. You've given something to somebody that's already got too much. Let them go without for a while. Let them go through a period of lack for a while. I'll tell you what, they'll learn to appreciate something again. Uh, and then give them something. Let them learn the lesson of contentment and then they will learn how to express proper appreciation. Well, my brothers and sisters, there's so much more. I feel like 
most of the good content where we're going is going to be in the second half of this message and for that i want to encourage you to tune in next week we will pick up again where we left off today but but i believe god is sharing some good stuff with us man keep your focus on god he loves you he knows your need he knows what you're going through and listen god will never no never no never let you fall he's a generous god and he delights in meeting your need your focus as a child of god must be to focus on appreciating the things that god has given you and being content in where god has placed you we'll speak more about that next week until then let me speak a blessing upon you most high god heavenly father we love you i thank you lord that even when we go through difficult times we know that our father is the owner of all things and lord god if 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 you have seen fit to let us go through a time of need then we understand that there's more to it than than just going through lack you're dealing with an area in our heart lord god I want to pray over every one of my brothers or sisters listening to this message. I want to speak a blessing of contentment upon them. That work of contentment. Because, oh God, one thing that I can say for sure is that one of those priceless gifts that we gather on this journey, on this side of uh, eternity, is that gift of contentment. Oh God, would you quieten that raging fire within them? Oh Lord, would you put those nerves at rest? Would you put at peace, uh, Lord God, that knot in that stomach, that sense of being without, that focus on all the lack? Oh God, I bear up my brothers and sisters before you right now because you are tender, you are kind, and you are merciful. And until we meet again next week, may you bless them, may you in encourage them O oh, father and may you form them and mold them evermore into the blessed image of our beloved savior jesus christ until next week god bless you and keep you bye bye